Hey everybody. Welcome to the Good Life Meditation for today. I'm trying to keep an eye on the phone and make sure it doesn't uh, fall off the motorcycle. My name's Kurt, and uh, the Good Life is something that I do every day to remind myself of my objectives and my principles. It's a simple set of uh, six objectives and 20 principles that uh, keep me on, my, on track in life. I developed these over a course of several years you know, trying to catalog uh, basically a course of action, you know, something to give uh, meaning and purpose to my life. You know, I'm a, I'm a non-believer. I don't, I don't believe that there's any uh, God or gods out there watching over us. And by virtue of that fact, I, I don't believe that there's any uh, divine mandate or, or moral code that uh, humans need to abide or follow. It's kind of up to us. We're, we're on our own with this stuff. And so, uh, it, to make good use of the time that we have, which I believe is quite finite, is, uh, as I believe that as there's no God or gods, likewise, I believe there's no soul and no eternity for us in, in life. When we die, that'll be the end. So, uh, I really do want to make good use of this time. So, here we go. This is something that I do every day, every morning. And uh, sometimes I do it fast, sometimes I do it slow. I always find that turning the camera on helps me do a better job. The first uh, objective is the objective to uh, be ready for death. To make sure that, and this consists of making sure that my affairs are in good order. There are three main spheres of my, you know, that would constitute my affairs, so to speak. The first is my um, familial affairs, my human connections. Make sure that uh, my relationship with my wife and my daughter and my brother and my mom, who I'm going out to see right now, actually. This is the little world that I take out to see my mom. Um, and other people in my life are, are in good, good state, so that if I fall off this cliff right now and break my neck, I um, really haven't left anything unsaid or unspoken. And to that end, I, I do kind of have something I have left unsaid for today. I always send my wife and daughter a text message in the morning, kind of a personalized thing, a, a, you know, a salutation as we start the day together, the three of us, and wishing them, wishing us all well, a safe and happy day, and then I'll see them tonight and tell them that I love them. And I haven't done that yet, but I'll do that after I make this video. The Otherwise, I think I'm in pretty good shape. I don't think there's anything, uh, any words unsaid to the people in my life. I'm, I mean, of course, there are, you know, lots of connections, and I might be missing the mark on some things, but to, to, to the best of my ability, I, I, I mean, there's nothing, there's no issues that are unresolved, and, and no simmering pots that need to be tended to in terms of my f familial uh, relations. So I'm satisfied with that one. I could die right now with that. The second one is my uh, financial situation, my household. And the only reason that's even on the list is because I am a family man. And I have uh, people to care for and think about beyond myself. So if I was to, again, fall off that cliff over there <laughs> and break my neck, will my family be well taken care of? They, yes and no. Not as good as I'd like. I have some work to do on that. I, uh, you know, they would have social security. And I'm, um, oh, I'm just you know, three months, four no, five months away from my pension being vested, so my wife would receive a, pe a lifelong pension after I, after I die, so if I can just make it another five months, <laughs> so be careful that it hurt. This is a tricky spot right here, can be a little bit of sand. So, yeah, that's not as good as it could be. I wish I had more savings, I wish I, I wish, you know, a house was paid for and stuff like that, but this is part of the consequence of the life that I chose to live. So, um, I know that my wife and daughter, if something did happen to me, they could uh, uh, the jettison their, the, the parachute, so to speak, is to uh, uh, jettison back to Japan to the safe, warm, uh, comfortable, uh, welcoming bosom of my wife's family in a little village that she grew up in, Yada, where uh, she, can, she and Emily can just slip right back in without a care in the world. Well, it's one of the real benefits of the uh, Japanese culture, is that, uh, that eternal family womb, or home, that hearth so to speak. So there's some comfort in that too. The third part for the being always ready to die is uh, kind of the more, it's, in some ways it might be considered the least important, but in some, in other ways it might be the most important. And that is our art, you know. 
is my my are my artistic endeavors in good shape that's important because that's kind of in some ways beyond just the enjoyment and the development enjoyment and the hard work of making a good family and being a good citizen and being a good human being leaving a little bit of a legacy about our impressions of the world and this experience a kind of a nice thing too I say it kind of least important because it seems kind of frivolous. It seems a very first world type of thing, first world concern. But what about my, what about my legacy? Right? <laughs> it does make a difference in terms of our, our satisfaction in life. So I have to ask myself, how's my legacy standing up in my artistic legacy? And I'm, I'm, I can tell you that ever since I finished my book, Going Alone, that pretty much feels like it's put to rest. I feel like there's more I could do, but I feel like I got it all out. That's, you know, that's the distillation of the first 50 years of my life. And if I have no more years of my life, then that's, that's enough. So I have another book in the works, The, uh, the Good Life, that will be the follow-up to Going Alone. You know, Going Alone addressed the fact of a universe, uh, uh, you know, uh, discovering a, a universe without purpose is the subtitle of Going Alone. Discovering a universe without purpose. The subtitle of The Good Life is... Uh, finding or de make creating meaning in a universe without purpose so yeah. I did touch on that in going alone in the section called the good life where I do outline these six objectives and 20 principles so that's okay if that's not it but the book the good life will be my chance to go into that in more detail so yeah I'd like to do that but I feel like I'm okay the rest is, you know, the hard work is done. I can go in at a moment's notice. So yeah, I think the first objective is in pretty good shape. I can go any moment. I don't want to, but I can. Whoa, 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 a little slippery right there. The next one, next objective is the objective of uh, the good and effective use of time. Just, you know, making, making good, oh, by the way, this canyon I'm on right now. This is the San Andreas Fault. This valley is formed of the San Andreas Fault. That is the giant fault that uh, basically runs up and down California. That's the uh, North American or the Pacific plate over here and then the North American plate over here on the right. So um, make good and effective use of time. That's another really important one. A very active one. One that I really do focus on every day. You know, the effort to make good use of the moments that I have. To not waste these away. Fritter them away frivolously. But to, but to really attend to these, as I like to call them, these failing moments. Not failing in terms of, you know, like a failed project, but failing in terms of dissipating away, like the sands in an hourglass. They're failing away, and I don't want to waste a moment of them. So I try to do that by, by using my time to do good things. Like, I, I don't have any time in my life for, you know, Silly TV shows, you know, sure, if it's entertainment, if it's just I'm tired and I just want to watch some mo nonsense stuff, that's fine. But for the most part, I mean, there's no time in my life for reruns. There's, there's so much new and interesting things to see. I'd much rather be moving and walking. And in the book Going Alone, I have a list of the things that I'd like to be caught doing when death comes to get me. And uh, those things, it's a list of about 30 things. Those things are the examples of things that I consider to be a good use of time. I'm tempted to try and enumerate some of these here now, but I'll probably get it, I'll probably get it all weirded out and wrong. <laughs> it's in the first chapter there, the second chapter there, um, which is the, whoa, no, no, the first chapter, the introduction, it's in there, I think. Anyway, number three, the third objective is the um, development and maintenance of good and sound life principles. You know, a secular morality is, less prescriptive as much as it is descriptive. What, what I mean by that is unlike an, a dogma which simply says thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do this. Uh, secular morality, especially the morality that I've created with the good life is basically saying describe me things. You know this, this, doing this might result in better satisfaction in life. Doing this might result in uh, uh, human thriving um, thing, and things like that. So I want to 
develop and maintain these descriptive principles, objectives and principles that will help keep me on track. And that's exactly this 6 and 20. So the third objective is basically the objective of tending to like a garden of, like a garden of, of ethics, <laughs> a garden of objectives, principles, a garden of morals, so to speak. You know, I, I'm a gardener in that garden and I have to spend my time on the care and feeding of the, of the values that I use in guiding my life. Oh, it's a real rough patch there. We're almost done with the dirt road now. Well, here's a sandy spot right here. Let's get through this. So, that's number three. And I do, I do that by doing exactly this, right? This, this hard work right here of developing and maintaining these life principles and objectives. Number four is the... What is that? like a device on the road. Looks like it's going to make up some dust. What kind of tool is that? Oh, it's a sweeper thinger. Interesting. So number four is the cultivation of good emotional reactions. That's the... This is really an important one. It's becoming the type of man that uh, doesn't fly off the handle. That uh, is in sober control of, of my emotions. It doesn't mean that I don't feel, and it certainly doesn't. And it doesn't mean that I repress them. It kind of sounds that way, right? Like you're you're angry, but it's you're not showing. So you're simmering inside. My experience, after many years of the, pursuing this now, has not been that. It doesn't. It's not like a boiling kettle where you're not letting the steam out, but the pressure just builds. I find that uh, the emotions are dispensed or dispersed or dissipated away in other ways, more, more creative ways. Uh, the bike feels a little strange. Hmm. Hopefully I don't have a flat tire. So what I try to do is I try to be I have a, like an early warning system. It's kind of like an alert. It's in my head and I can sense when uh, the challenging emotions like anger and frustration and jealousy, uh, you know, uh, in, intolerance, in, in temp, intemperance, is that emotion? Why does the bike feel strange? Maybe it's this road. Just checking to make sure I'm doing okay. I think I'm okay. But the bike does feel a little strange. So back to back on point. So it's okay, like right now, right? I'm, the bike's feeling a little strange. And I've got a bit of an anxiety that's rising in my breast right now. You know, it's like, oh wow, you know, here's what it, here's what it feels like. You know, oh wow, you know, maybe, maybe I got a flat tire. Maybe I, or I got or picked up a rock through a tire on that dirt road or something like that, or got a nail or something like that, or, or maybe I broke the suspension or something like that. And now the bike's starting to fail, and I'm going to be in Wrightwood soon. And maybe by the time I get up there, the bike's going to be done. And I know there's no motorcycle shop in there. And what am I going to do about that? Oh my gosh, I'm going to get a tow truck, and, and I can't see my mom. And then what am I going to do? If I take the tow truck, get, get a tow truck, is there enough miles to get it back to the Orr's Motor Ride so he can take care of it for me? And then what am I going to do about going to work tomorrow? Because I do have to work on Saturday and Sunday, and I won't have time to get another car or vehicle. Okay, see what's happening there? That kind of happens in fast forward motion as, as I'm just going along. But instead of just letting that, that script unwind, unmoderated or un unaddressed, I'm, I'm keeping an eye open for it. And I'm noticing it when it's happening. I say, wait a minute there, you. <laughs> What's this dialogue you got going on there? Okay, and then ask myself quickly, you know, is this reasonable? Is this a fight or a flight thing? Do I need to, to whoa, keep on your track? Or do I need to address something? Like if it was indeed a dangerous thing, like, you know, my front tire's starting to go flat, you know, I need to quickly assess that and get this bike off to the side of the road because that's really a bad thing. That's a fight or a flight thing. That emergency, that, er e that early, that eagerness that's coming up is actually p playing a useful purpose. If not, like right now I can feel the bike feel, still feels a little strange, but maybe it's just this uneven road, this loose, loose gravel, it says. Maybe that's all it is. So I'll 
you know, exercise a little temperance to hold back the emotion a little bit and think it through. Monitor the bike and carry on. So that's kind of, look at this old building. Look at that. So that's kind of what I mean by having good, uh, um, controlling my emotions, you know, good emotional reactions to the world around me. Keeping that up throughout the day with just about every circumstance I can imagine that I encounter. Especially in circumstances like at work, when I'm, I'm a project manager, so I'm in a lot of meetings with a lot of people. I, I tend to lead the meetings as part of my job. And, you know, things go south, you know, things don't go, go as we expect, you know, people, humans are humans. And it's easy to get anxious or frustrated or angry even, but it's a good forum also to practice being mo moderating those emotions, coming up with better responses. <coughs> and that may even mean uh, adjourning <coughs> the deliberation of a particular difficult task until uh, we can reconvene with better facts. Okay, that's enough of that one. Next one, number f uh, five is the... Um, Look at that road, wow. What's the next one? Okay, uh, control, uh, control of good emotions. Uh, the next one is, oh, performance of good actions. Just doing good things. That's an easy one, right? I mean, so many, oft so often things we can see that we know are good things that we can do. We can step out of our way, especially if you can do so without wish of any reward of any sort. And I don't need to enumerate any of these or even provide any examples. We all know what they are. And it really makes a difference to the world and to us to be a man or a woman who does those things. Just for their own sake. Number six is the recognition of true limits and true opportunity. It seems like a very simple one, but in many ways this is probably one of the most subtle difficult and important of all of my principles, and maybe all of my, of all of my objectives, and maybe all of the principles even as well. For if we can discern what is within our control, because that's really all we have that we really can, our, our, what's within our potential is what we have control over. And what we really, the only thing we really have control over is our emotional, is how we respond to the circumstances of life. We can make decisions, but they don't always turn out the way we want, but we can certainly control how, how we respond to those outcomes. What we can't control is most of what happens in life and in the world. So it's really a small, small sphere that represents the area of our control. Let me check the tire again. It's okay. So Rick, keep keeping that in mind as we move through the day. And as I do it right now, it's I feel like there's this little bubble of what I can control. And that includes right now things like you know watching the road, looking for any gravel in the road, monitoring my speed, being cognizant of what's traffic that's coming, coming up behind me. Looking, monitoring the bike, thinking about my emotions, checking on rising feelings and any anxieties. All of these little things. For the rest of it, I can't control any of this other stuff. It really does change things when uh, we know where the controls are and where, how, how to firmly put our hands on the control and sticks on the stick of our life and guide ourselves within reason. Here we are in Wrightwood. And yeah, we've made it. Looks like the bike's still running. I'll lose gravel again the sign, but watch out for that nice house. Okay, we've made it through our uh, six objectives. Let's talk about the 20 principles now. Wrightwood, by the way, is the small mountain. Uh, hold on. small mountain snow skiing community here in the mountain San Bernardino Mountains up in the edge of the high desert. It's the desert out there. You can see through the trees. I come up here to see my mom. She lives up here in the desert. Okay, let's talk about the principles. The first is the principle of war. Awake every morning, ready to go to war. 
with everything that I hold dear and everything that you hold dear. And that really isn't a, an objective that is going to war for war's sake, but going for, to war in order to help... Uh, big bug... Well, let me... To help ensure that uh, the things that I believe... Flash flood channel here. Are indeed true. The things that I hold to be true are true. I don't want to be suffering through life holding to things that aren't actually accurate. Beliefs, principles, facts, rumors, things like that. So I test them. And in particular, I test my own first. So that would mean that I have to re-examine my 6 and 20 every day and uh, look for weaknesses and failings. And the way I got to the 6 and 20 was just through that process. It took a couple of years, like I said, to develop them. And I weeded some things out, kept some things in, changed the language. It's all very carefully langu language for particular purposes. And then I do the same with the things that others propose are true. And in particular, right now, I'm doing that with uh, Christian beliefs because it is the dominant religion of my culture. And I was sent a Bible and asked to read it. So I'm doing so. I'm taking up that, that, that challenge. And... Uh, reasonably, rationally looking through the claims as I go. It's a very pleasant experience. I'm learning a lot and sharing that with others on Facebook and on YouTube. So oh, this war thing is not a... Uh, it's not something I'm doing for some sadistic pleasure in being a troll. It's something that I'm doing so that I can live believing as many truth in the words of Matt Delaney, believing as many true things as possible and not believing as many untrue things as possible. Number two. Firewood, $260 a quart. No, that's not number two. <laughs> number two, the um, principle of reason. If warring against what I believe is true is my objective, then Reason is the tool that I use in the execution of that battle. Reason and its sub-principles of honesty and objectivity. So I need to be honest with myself when I'm when my investigation shows something I like and also honest with myself when they show something I don't like. You know? Like, what, we, what do, would I do if it turns out that my Bible study reveals to me that God actually is real? And more, more so that the Christian God is actually real. Well, I, I really want to be the type of person that will admit that. It doesn't mean I'm going to like it necessarily, and it doesn't mean that I'll uh, become an adherent or follower of the Hebrew God, of Yahweh. But I would have to at least acknowledge that, yeah, it looks like it's true. So reason and honesty, I mean honesty and, and objectivity are my tools in that purpose. So I'm honest, I try to be honest with myself, ask myself, is this piece of evidence that I've just discovered or read about, is this, is this good evidence? And be objective, looking at it in terms of the real facts, not my internal bias and expectations. Next, uh, the principle of the homunculus. That's number three. Uh, the homunculus, of course, homunculus is a word that simply means uh, the little man. If you look it up on Google, you'll find that you find pictures of like a little man inside. It's typically shown inside of a head. Like you, if there's, you could have a hinge on your door and your skull and open up your head, you'd see a little guy inside. I like to say every time I make this video that imagine, uh, uh, remember in the movie, um, what was it, Men in Black, the little alien that lived inside the skull, he was like a newspaper vendor, I think, like that. Hold on, I'm going to sneeze. Or maybe not. Hey, I see a motorcycle ahead. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, so that's the homunculus. What the hell am I talking about? <laughs> it described the homunculus. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, I don't believe we have a soul. 
I don't think anybody knows really or has could give a good example, a good definition of what a soul is. No, I've never been able to find anybody who could do that. No, I'll just kind of say this nebulous, touchy-feely thing that seems to survive our death. It's like a spirit of some sort that lives inside of us and floats away, some disconnected thing. I, I, there's no real, real, there's no good reason at all to think that that's actually true, that it, that exists. So since I don't believe that, what I do like to do is remind myself of that fact by ascribing my, my consciousness as a piece of my biology. So as a part of my biology, that means it's going to die when I die. When this body of mine passes, so too whatever this consciousness is. And we all kind of are aware of the consciousness. You kind of feel it in your head, right? It's, it's that little that little thing that seems to be seated just behind your eyeballs, behind your forehead, peeking up through your eyes, between your ears there. It's, we all, I think, have that, have that sense of where it is. Um, I call that the homunculus, and it's attached in there. When I die, it won't slip away. It'll just wake out like a, kind of like when the music stops. And where, where does the music go? It doesn't go anywhere, it just stops. Likewise, when you snuff out a candle, where does the, the flame and the light go? It's just gone. So too the homunculus. It's attached to my biology. It's no different than my spleen or my or my uh, my liver. It's, it's a helpful thing to remember that. Number four is the home of good and evil. And the home of good and evil, I specifically placed it right next to the homunculus for the re for a reason. Because I don't believe that there's any good or evil floating around in the universe. I haven't been able to find any. That's one of the advantages of spending so much time in the wilderness alone. Is to kind of realize after a while that, hey, there doesn't seem to be anything out here. Just, uh, just wilderness. Just, just elements and, and, and nature and physics. And can't see any, there's no evidence of, of any handiwork of God or God, God itself or uh, anything like that. And therefore there's no good or evil out there either. There, there's no laws written in the stars or inscribed on the stones. Good and evil do appear indeed to be subjective opinions that we have. Although you can apply, you can develop them in an objective way by using reason to determine what constitutes good and bad, but in the end, even that is a bad opinion in some ways. I guess the objective part comes when we can agree. This is snow skiing slopes, by the way. I've been there, I've snowed, I've skied on that. The objective part is the when you and I agree. When you and I agree that it's good, that human flourishing is a good thing, that putting the cyanide in the, in the drinking water is a bad thing, then we have kind of an objective, an objective goodwill. What is that? Sunbelt Rentals. Interesting. I can see uh, engine uh, like burning something coming out of the top. Okay, do you get it? I'm sorry, I kind of went around. Good and evil are opinions, and the reason I put it next to homunculus is that they're opinions held, maintained, and managed by the homunculus. So I have concepts of good and evil that are, are my own, and it's up to me to hold on to them and maintain them. I'm going to stop up here. There's a little, uh, an old stone building here that's kind of used by the rangers these days. It's like a ranger station. Let's stop. <laughs> Talk about this for a little bit. Morning. Good, thanks. So this was used, this was a place that was like back in the 1920s. Whoops. Well, why is that doing that? Music came on. Back in the 1920s and 30s and stuff like that. I don't remember how old, it, how long ago this was built. But this was a uh, place that, um, uh, like it was like a lodge. Tourists would come here. That structure over there was a bridge that went across the road over there. And this was like a real popular place for like, you know, the, what would you call them? 
the, I think you can hear me now, I just lifted the visor. The people that would come, you know, not the flappers, but you know that era, they would back like motor trips up from Los Angeles to come up here and uh, tool around. It's all empty now. Oop. I don't know if you guys can see in there, there's a stage. I can see a stage in there. I wonder what kind of performances went on in there. And over here was the bridge. So that's the um, home of good and evil. It's our, our sense of right and wrong. Residing with our homunculus and maintained by the homunculus. It's like, it's like a castle, don't you think? The next, number five, is the principle of purpose. Our purpose is a something we have to make up on our, on our own. Although, because I, I, I don't think that there's any objective purpose to, in the world. That's not completely true. I do think there is one. So that one purpose is biological. The very nature of what we are, our biology, kind of informs us that we should stay alive as long as possible and reproduce and create as many copies of our genes as possible. That's how our basic system works. It's our mandate, it's our biological mandate. Bear country, avoid confrontation, don't surprise bears, make noise. Wow. Ooh, I thought it was a person standing right there, Smoky Bear. <laughs> so they had like a garden area out here before. And um, so we do that, I mean, we're all kind of subconsciously do that, right? I mean, we, we all strive to save our lives, to preserve ourselves, to stay healthy, things like that. And for the most part, most of us seem to try to reproduce, create a family, have a child or more, and do that. Look at all the bees coming in for the water. I guess this is an old pond at one time. The old past life of this place. <clears throat> Interesting, huh? Interests change. <sighs> Someone must have been so proud when they first built this place. 1926. In memory of David Burroughs, Big Pines Historical Society. His life touched many. His efforts will forever touch others. Nice. Let's walk up these stairs. So, um, whoop. So biological purpose, you know, stay alive and reproduce. You know, back to me, because, you know, <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> Just kidding. I know sometimes it seems that way. And I'd have to revert to, you know, talk about, you know, quote Thoreau, who once said, uh, I would, Henry David Thoreau, who said, I would fain not speak so much of myself if there were anybody else whom I knew so well. Isn't that the case? I mean, wouldn't we all want in our own... Wouldn't you want, if you're listening to the words of another, for them to speak plainly and clearly from the perspective that they hold? Isn't that why we're tuning into what they're saying anyway? Share their perspective? Weather station, I think. Where do these stairs go? So, for myself, then, I've decided that my other purpose, and I only have one other purpose after staying alive and reproducing, that other purpose is to be a virtuous man. I see lights up there. Huh. Where virtue is defined as the improvement of the objective well-being of thinking creatures. 
sure I've borrowed a little bit from Sam Harris and others in that definition. Look at this big tree. Kind of looks like redwood, doesn't it? Oh, it must have come from there. Falling over. Wow, big tree. Improvement in well-being. I like that. Like I said, I didn't make it up. I like this because it uh, is very practical, right? What's well-being? Well, what well-being is uh, be, uh, basically uh, flourishing, right? Being healthy, being uh, sound mind, sound body, and uh, being able to contribute to the well-being of others. And to be in kind of a, oh, oh gee, kind of a state of uh, equilibrium in our life in terms of our ability to utilize our days to wake in the morning, make good use of our time towards these ends I just mentioned. That's well, well-being for ourselves and others. And my life, my life purpose, is to be a kind of a man that can live that kind of life, do those things. And that's what I strive for. So that was number five. Let's get into number six. The number six principle is the atomic principle. Now I usually lift sand when I do this, but today I'll lift pine needles. Let's blow them in the air. Atomic principle. Everything is just bits and pieces, flowing and changing, and forever transforming. So too you and me. Just like handfuls of, you know, all this decom these trees will decompose down into the sand and the soil. So too you and me. Before long I'm going to be, uh, uh, probably burned up. But if that doesn't happen, then I'll be, uh, consumed up and gone. And my stuff will be used elsewhere. By else, by else, by else, by, by others. All those bees. Those are, whole, those are yellow jackets, I think. Remember, and it's good to keep that in mind, to remember the atomic principle. Because it helped me to not think that there's anything more permanent than anything less ephemeral in me than sand in the wind. Number seven, the principle of nature. Everything in the universe has some particular nature, including you and me. It's good to keep in mind what that is. Because when we can remember the nature of things, we can uh, do a better job of uh, abiding by nature. Like it's the nature of this building to be quiet and imposing, to be evocative of memories of a of a time when values were somewhat different. People came here for recreation and it represented something different than it does now. Now it's just kind of a memory, kind of a disused forestation. It's good to remember that uh, it's the nature of these roads to be windy, mountain roads, and to have gravel and be a little bit slippery, a little bit dangerous. There's my bike. It's the nature of the bike to uh, be a machine prone to break down, prone to uh, malfunction in some way, but also prone to be reliable for the most part and carry me where I need to go. But I shouldn't be surprised um, if it succeeds in bringing me where I need, need to go and also succeeds in breaking down. It's the nature of a smoky bear to uh, remind us to, uh, what does he remind us to do? Only you can prevent forest fire. <laughs> Oh, fire danger is high today. It's in my own nature to uh, 
represent the characteristics that I've developed over the years, of 54 years of life, and now with the seven, the six principles and 20, six objectives and 20 principles, to be an embodiment of that. Yeah, I can go on. I think you get the point. Number nine, the social principle. Human beings are social animals. Ah. We need one another to survive. And our best ends are social ends. Remind myself of that. Keep in mind that there's great virtue, subjectively speaking. There's great virtue because I, I believe it so in being a, a social man and pursuing social ends. So that's what I do. Number 10, the Feast of Ophel. Feast of Awful is, remember I was talking before about letting the emotions run away? You take the best of us, oh, God, you know, gosh darn it, it's my mind's gonna break down my anxiety, what am I gonna do, you know? Or someone road rage cuts me off, or I get angry at work, or something like that. Spilling all that out is, is, is like, you know, the word awful means just waste, like, like butchery, right? You know, the, it's the waste and byproduct after you butcher an animal that you don't want to eat, you make it roll it into a sausage. It's kind of, you know, gross stuff. Likewise, I think of it as the gross stuff that comes of our unprincipled, undisciplined living, where we share that with the world, our frustration and anxiety. We've all done it. You know, we all see it happening all the time. Time. The funny thing is, you wouldn't want to eat the gross stuff off the butcher's table. Maybe they'll roll it up into a sausage and you'll eat it then. But for the most part, you wouldn't want to do it. But we seem quite happy to consume the waste and discard and filth that our fellows give out through their intemperate uh, actions. You know, someone flips us off on the road for road rage. You know, we feel injustice and we start chasing after it. Or, or you know, some, something, someone uh, at work is having a bad day and they're a little bit gruff and mean and you know, we respond in kind. Rather than just, you know, letting those things kind of slip past us. Uh, letting, letting the feast go by without uh, you know, sampling anything along the way. It's a better thing live a better life that way. <laughs> of course, there's got to be justice. You should net out. Um, there's, there's good reasons to get angry sometimes, but a lot of it isn't a good reason. It's just getting angry as a kind of a, a knee-jerk response. That's that's the Feast of Awful, and I try to avoid that. Excuse me while I stay, clean my There we go. Okay, let's hit the road. Okay, we have ten more principles to cover. Let's go over these. The next principle is... Uh, I do love this bike. 110,000 miles. I know it's, it's days are numbered. Just like me. <laughs> and how many miles I got. The difference is, you can get another bike. <clears throat> the end of me is the end of me. All the more reason to make good use of this time, right? Good and effective use of time. Number 11. The 11th principle is something we kind of already touched on a little bit. It's the, it's the principle of temperance. Being able to, you know, temperance, of course, you know, you don't know that word. It just simply means controlled consumption. We think of temperance particularly with regard to, you know, alcohol. Temperance society of the, you know, of the, um, what was that, the prohibition era. But temperance also means other things. Temperance it means controlled consumption of just about anything. It could be alcohol could be um, could be cigarettes could be donuts food of any sort 
work, play, sex. Basically, it's avoiding the overindulgence in just about anything. Actually, I've got 114,000 miles. It's definitely time for uh, some more, uh, you know, to get my bike out of the door, take a look at my bike, get it serviced. Basically, temperance is control consumption of all things so that we don't overdo it. And there's virtue in the very exercise of temperance as well as the end result that it yields us, which is improved health and living, better use of our finances, better use of our, of our time. But just the exercise of temperance of lo alone is kind of like the, the benef one of the benefits of health is health. Does that make any sense? <laughs> kind of like a, a it's, it's its own benefit in its own right you know being that type of person it imbues us with uh, kind of like a it's, it's like a it's like a virtue in its own right and a great satisfaction comes in being a temperate individual for its own sake so I strive to do that in all things in particular in the consumption of my emotions. Like I said before, as emotions rise, I don't imagine them being a, a feast at a table, but instead of the feast being the leg of lamb and chicken breasts and you know, mashed potatoes and apple pie, it's a, it's a banquet of emotions, you know. And these can be the negative emotions I said before, but it could also be positive emotions, like like lust or 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 you know, since or you know, pleasures of all sorts. As these things are placed upon the table, instead of greedily consuming them up, you know, you know, lustily going after someone, or 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 you know, buying up all of the. Uh, comic books in, in a particular comic series that I want just because I can and because I'm, they're there or, or eating too much too many donuts or or uh, you know you get the idea indulging in those things you know, you know the after effect of that right you know how that feels afterwards whereas if you can restrain yourself wow the, it may be a little difficult but it sure does feel good huh that's why there's three sub principles to temperance. The first one is suffering, because it hurts a little bit. It's hard to deny ourselves what we want, so we have to suffer a little bit. But the suffering tends to not last very long, and then the reward that comes after is very rich and deep. The second uh, sub principle of temperance is uh, simplicity, and that's simply added because. If we live a simple life, then we are by extension living a temperate life. Because simplicity is temperance. And if we make it a part and parcel of our living, then we don't really have to work hard at it. <laughs> it just becomes part of what we are. The third one is uh, apathy. A little harder to understand, maybe. Apathy has a is a word that has kind of a bad rap. We think of someone as apathetic because they don't care. We we picture, you know, a riot scene occurring on TV or nine one one. Remember nine one one and someone who uh, watching all of that unfold with you know seemingly little 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 interest and little caring. We would call them apathetic. It's not a not a compliment. The type of apathy I'm referring to here is similar but a little bit different. It's an apathy that comes of recognizing something that's outside of our control and not being overly swayed by it. It's just a fact. You could then go to the riot scene on TV or 911 happened on TV and you could indeed be someone, you know, who's who's not, you know, broken down to tears or or rising to anger or, or whatever, but just kind of sitting quietly, taking it all in. Apathetic. Is that such a bad thing? It doesn't mean that they don't care, and it doesn't mean that they can't take some action. It just means that they recognize that there's really not much they can do watching TV for an event far away. There's no real benefit. And, 
gnashing at their teeth or tearing at their clothes or maybe yelling in, out, you know, in outrage. Although it may feel good at the moment and it may cause reassuring re re and, and positive social repercussions among those who are observing this and thinking, wow, this person really cares, a really sensitive person. Really, in effect, that's an end in itself, right? I mean, and is, it, is it a good end? Wouldn't it be better to kind of maintain our faculties and our, our equilibrium and our state of mind and our reason? And then to be able to think about how can I make good use of this fact in moving forward? That's apathy. And I try to do that myself in all kinds of circumstances. Like for example, if the bike were indeed to break down right now, I would try to be apathetic to that fact alone. There's not a lot I can do about that fact. I can't, you know, twitch my nose and magically fix the motorcycle or rewind uh, time and go back to the home this morning and have a little bit of intuition that says instead of driving to the desert to see my mom today, I should probably take the bike to the shop. Those things can't happen. So why get upset? Is that house still there? It's still there, yeah. So why get upset? Why be frustrated? Just be apathetic. I try to make good use of the facts. Move forward. So if I pull, if the bike blah, 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 it breaks down right now, or I get a flat tire, or whatever it is, I'll pull to the side of the road, I'll calmly assess the situation, and I'll take appropriate and suitable action. I'll call my mom and let her know I'll be, I'm going to be late, or I might not be there at all. I'll call the tow truck, AAA, I've got AAA, and uh, have them come out and take the long ride back to Lior's Moto Ride to get my bike fixed. And I'll uh, adjust my life accordingly, calmly, with the good, collected, emotional condition. So I talked a lot about temperance just now. Let's go into, uh, that's because it's a big one. Let's go into the next one, which is, uh, after temperance is apath no, agency. Oh, I talked about temperance and the sub-principles of suffering, simplicity, and apathy. So I want to keep those in mind. Let's talk about the next one, which is, um, Agency, the great indifference. If you've read my book, Going Alone, you'll recall that term, the great indifference, and I talk about it in a lot of my Going Alone videos. Great indifference is the silence of the universe, as I think it's the philosopher Todd, Todd May describes it. The silence of the universe. The universe seems to really have nothing to say about all this. At least nothing we've been able to yet discern. There's plenty who disagree. We'll say, no, the universe speaks plenty. The very, the very handiwork of God is found in everything you see around you. Just look at the trees. They uh, reveal the, uh, the fact of the Lord. Well, maybe you see that. I don't. I just see trees. I don't see any necessary cause behind that other than the long complex chain of chemical reactions that seem to have occurred since the moment of abiogenesis when life first came into existence on the planet and before that the long series of, um, of events that occurred in the formation of our <coughs> solar system, planet, solar system, galaxy and then the universe itself and who knows what was before that if anything. So. When I look out in the universe and I hold my ear to listen to any voice being back there, I don't hear it. It's just quiet. I call that the great indifference. It's the great indifference of the universe to uh, our, the fact of us that being here. So I, I don't think, I have no good reason to think that there's any God, gods, or any, any guiding force that's uh, running anything. And if there is, it certainly seems very well hidden and it's indistinguishable from not existing. I call that the great indifference. That's a startling, very frightening thing. It's the uh, source of you know, that, that philosophical state condition called nihilism. I believe it's the source at least. Where you think, what's, what's, the, what's the purpose? It's all futile. Who, wh what does it all matter? Well, instead of uh, going down that road, which is definitely a, a potential, potential path to go down, 
when you encounter the great indifference. And I, I will put to you that I think it's hard to discover the great indifference unless you're alone in very wild places, and not just any wild place. It needs to be the right type of place. It needs to be a desert, a moonscape, where there's very little life. Because all this stuff, and I'll get onto it in just a second, the agency part, I haven't talked about that yet. All this life around us has a tendency to, even if it's not sentient life, it has a tendency to dull and mask the great indifference. You need really to get out to a desert, a deep desert, an empty desert, a moonscape, like I said. And then you can perceive the nothing that appears to be behind it all, or the emptiness of the silence. So what is this agency stuff? Well, agency, of course, is just the word we can use to describe something that has some will of its own, some thinking thing, or some living thing, some purposeful thing. I believe that trees are agents, all plants are, because they're following I think, some the unwinding of a biological mandate that is inher that is comes from their genetic coding. So to all living things, the bugs and the birds and the bees and the animals and you and me, we're all agents. So that's the what I mean when I say agency. Agency is all this stuff, all this life. And the great indifference is what's left when you subtract out the life and you're faced with just the raw, unliving universe. It appears to be quite silent, quite dead. Even though, as I say in my book, death is flattery. To call to call the great indifference a corpse is is to is to give it a great compliment because it never seems to have been alive. So it cannot be, a corpse implies that it was once alive and it doesn't seem like that was even the case. So it's good to keep that perspective, to be aware of the great indifference and to be aware of the uh, agency that, that uh, makes it all worthwhile. That's why when I go to the wilderness, I so often come back so eagerly to, oh, look at that big bird. I come back to uh, all of this. Let's catch up with this big bird. Hi, big bird. Look at you. Red-tailed hawk, I think. Wow. Okay, what's after uh, the agency of the great indifference? That's the next one is um, the best seat in the house. This is a simple one. I just strive every day to remind myself that I really don't want to be anyone else or be anywhere else or be doing anything else but I'm okay with just where I am what I am and what I'm doing and I mean this is a pretty good where what and when and who right now at this very moment of course riding a motorcycle through these mountains all alone on a big powerful BMW motorcycle is running like a chomp right now and I'm feeling good no pains or aches in my bodies yeah that onset of age, old age, hasn't really begun to hit me too hard yet. This is good. I mean, yeah, of course, who would want to? Who would want to be anything else right now? This is a good. This is a good place and time and who to be. But I want to keep that perspective, even if that isn't the case. Even after my health begins to fail, even after my fortunes wane, and even after uh, the place that I'm in becomes a source of discomfort, too hot, too cold, no place just right. I still want to make that the best seat in the house. What a worthy ambition that is, huh? To, to bring an end to overt striving and be okay with what it is. Doesn't mean that I don't try anymore. It just means that along the way I'm okay with where I am, what I am, and who I'm doing. Who I'm doing. <laughs> who I am. That's another principle altogether. We'll leave that one off. We'll put that on the back cover. <laughs> okay. Next one is number 14, the path of wildness. This came, um, this is probably the earliest principle. This came out of Japan. Path of wildness emerged when I would uh, be hiking in the mountains of Japan, these you know, really rugged mountains. And I would always have a principle I learned from Thoreau, which is to uh, return by a path that I, a, a different path. So if I climbed up one canyon to get into a mountain, I would try to go over the ridge and come back by a different canyon, which meant that I was coming back via places I'd never been before. And sometimes I would come to, you know, circumstances where I didn't know left or right, because I, um, I didn't come up that way. So 
swims left would be the right way and right would be the edge of a waterfall. And I would not really know, but I would just kind of use my reason to say, okay, well, think about it, Kern. Where's the water flow likely going? Which one is going to likely to have the, the, wa the waterfall? You know, which terrain looks like it could be hiding a, a giant hort and nest that I want to stay away from and stuff like that. But I would never really get all the facts. So what I would begin to do is kind of just rely ultimately like a cherry on the top, like the deciding thrust, even though I'd weighed all the options rationally, I'd say, I just, my gut tells me to go right, and I'd go right. So you get the idea? So collect as many facts as I possibly can, you know, tabulate them, give them some good consideration, and then in the end, if that wasn't quite enough, well, just go with my gut, you know, my reasoned gut feeling. You know what? That usually wound up being all right. And that's probably because either right or left would have been okay. <laughs> but it usually worked out okay. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes that wound me up looking over the edge of a 100-foot waterfall that I couldn't go down. That I had to go back. But you know what? Both of them were all right in their own right. Even the uh, negative one turned out to be an interesting adventure. In fact, I can remember with more distinction now than just about anything else, the wrong paths that I took. I can still see those clearly in my mind. That moment of anxiety as I looked over the edge of a 100-foot waterfall and realized, uh, this was the wrong way to go. Eight years later, ten years later, I still relive that distinctly in my mind, that experience. And I made it back. I didn't fall off the edge. And I'm sure when I'm an old man, I'll have those memories still. So the idea is that as I go through life and I'm faced with a decision, I'll collect the facts, give myself a little time to think about it, and when that time's up, I'll, uh, I do one of two things. I'll either give myself more time to think about it a little more, collect a few more facts, or I'll make a decision. But I caution myself to watch out giving myself, you know, endless grants of time because you can, f I can fritter away my life or large portions of my life, you know, vacillating back and forth. And that's where this whole idea really began to show up in sharing it with others when I was in Japan. Because I would get email from people, usually young 20-somethings, men and women, writing to me asking, you know, because I, because they saw what I did. I went to Japan and made a life for myself there, and not being Japanese. And how did I do that? How did I get the courage? How did I make that happen? How did I get a job? You know, how did I find a, a Japanese person to, to settle with, and a family? What's that like? And how did I do that? They would all want to know. And the vast majority of them, I would tell them, answer the questions that they had, but the vast majority of them, the ones that I was able to follow, never really did anything. They just kind of basically went back to their, you know, you know, you worrying and fretting about all the dangers. A few of them would basically take the information I gave them, add that to the information they already had, and give themselves a, a line in the sand and say, you know, I'm going to make a decision. And those that, 100%, those that made the decision to go to Japan, it all worked out well. Even when it didn't, I would argue. For a few of them, it may have seemed like it didn't, but I would like to talk to them again in ten, another 10 or 15 years and ask them if that experience of it going bad was really all that bad. I'll bet that those experiences are to them what it was like to me to make the wrong choice and have that realized when I was facing over the edge of a 100-foot cliff waterfall. And at the moment, I'm going, gosh, darn, I made a bad mistake. But later realizing that may have been uh, the most interesting path I could have taken. That's the path of wildness. And I like to say, I have a little, like a little limerick that I say to remind myself of the path of wildness, and it's in the book. It basically goes like this, it says, a beast tracked through the brush. The owl oh, crud, I'm not gonna get it right. <laughs> what is it, it's four lines, right? It goes, uh, the path of wildness is easy to find leaves blown in the wind. The, no, the course of water, the, the path of wildness is easy to find. The course of a stream. Leaves blown in the wind. The beasts track through the brush and the direction of our first inclination. I repeat that several times in the book in that chapter. It really does sum it up. And I, I use that example to use the I imagery of natural 
courses, you know, leaves blowing in the wind, the course of water, the track of a beast. I mean, imagine beasts. I mean, they don't give too much thought to where they're going. They'll think about it, but a lot of it's instinct, right? And for the most part, it tends to work out pretty good for them if they, you know, if they can tend to survive. You know, and relatively speaking, not always. They can, do, they can live a life like that as well, especially when you remember, if, if you think like I do, that there ain't nothing after this. You get this, whoa, there's a quail. There's usually more when, where one came from. There's usually more. California State Bird. I'm riding with, standing up with one hand right now. It feels good. The air temperature is perfect. Look at this little drain up here. This little water pipe right here. I think it's an old system. This old house down there. Anyway, the path of wildness. Use it to get unstuck in life. Use it to find your way. Next one is uh, number 15. The risk of avoiding risk. I, I like to describe two layers of risk in life. The first is the surface level or more immediate risk. What's the risk of not doing the practical things that are recommended to us, like uh, going to school, getting as much education as you can at school, finding someone to suitable to marry and settle down with and start a family with, save money, buy a house, and be fiscal, fiscally responsible. Those three basic things are the things that all parents basically want for their kids. They want you to go to school. They want you to find a nice gal or, gal or girl to, to settle down with. And they want you to, to buy a house and start a family and live, live the, the good life through the security that, and the safety and the, and the comfort that comes of those three things. I call those the surface level risks of life because they're the most obvious, right? Everybody points them out to us through a young age and everybody kind of almost instinctively knows, you know, if you want a good life, better do those things. But I'd like to argue that there's a, a deeper risk as well. This is the risk of, of not heeding that little voice inside you, that little, that little inclination that says there's something more, there's something kind of innate, something calling. That could be adventure or art or self-realization or you know, learning a language, living in a foreign country. All those different things that make life spicy and good, right? Give us, help us to create ourselves into the man or woman that we want to be. If you don't give yourself those, particularly at a young age, well, let me just say, you'll basically become the person that you live. I don't know if there's called the devil punch bowl. So I recommend uh, the following course of action through life. If I was, and I tell this to my daughter, give yourself the decade of the 20s. And in that decade, do a couple of things. One, go as far as you possibly can with education. I mean, as far as you possibly can. At minimum, get a bachelor's degree. You know, if feasible. Go for a master's or a, even a PhD if you can. The reason I suggest that at a young age is that the, not so much for the degree as much as for the academic experience, the experience of academia. Regardless of what people say any, these days about the value of an education, there is great value in being a part of the institutions of academia, particularly the, and I know this is a dirty word these days, the, uh, um, the perspective of, of, of liberal studies. Looking at the world with a kind of an open mind and somewhat welcoming to ideas that may at first not appear comfortable it doesn't mean you have to accept them. It just means that we're going to learn a little bit about them. And you're going to meet other people who might propose those ideas and hold up those ideas. And you'll get to see that they're not other. They are people. And you'll get a little more reality about those things than just the propaganda <coughs> and the bias that is usually ascribed. Plus the community of of, of a of a group of men and women who are striving towards things. This is St. Andrew's Abbey. Let's just take a quick drive through here. This is where uh, my mom will be buried one day. 
there's a guy up here, Father Philip, who's been kind of a family, he's a Catholic place, and he's been a uh, family friend for decades, long bearded fellow, very old. My stepfather's ashes are interred up here, actually. Sometimes I take my mom out here when we come to visit. She, she likes this place. No hunting, except for peace. <laughs> oh, here you go. Hi. Good morning. Very pleasant. life that you chose to live. If you don't do that, they've got a burned up old house, rock house there. If you don't do that, dare I say, I don't want to know, I'm not going to dare say. Just be watch out. Let me just frame it a different way. <laughs> the sure way to become the most interesting man or woman at the cocktail party is to give yourself the decade of the 20s live the life that you dream of and then come back grinning ear to ear with a half your brain full of stories of adventure and com characteristics and that you couldn't have gained in any other way also with battle scars blood loss and broken maybe dreams or maybe broken presuppositions. Or maybe you're just a broken man or woman altogether and how, what a blessing that would be if you could survive it. Again, back to the point of, uh, like I said about the people who went to Japan, where things might not have gone so well, but I would say they talked to them in 10 or 15 later, and years later and let's hear what they say about that then. Likewise, if you can become a broken man or woman in your 20s. <laughs> how nice to get that out of the way, hey? <laughs> These are Joshua trees. I think you'll find the effort is worthwhile. That's the 
principle number 15, the risk of avoiding the risk. The surface level risks of life, you know, education, finances, and companionship, and the deep level risk of life, of living the life of your dreams, even if it's only for, in earnest, for a half a decade. How much greater the, the years to come after that? How much less likely a midlife crisis would you uh, have already satisfied those longings and those dreams? and are simply building upon them for the rest of your life. How much better to be ready to die when in your mid-50s, early 60s, you begin to feel your mortality creeping up on you and uh, the end is near. I think you'll find the effort was worthwhile. Okay, just a few more now. We have uh, four more. The next is uh, complete oblivion, principle number 16. When life is over, it appears to be that there's no final, when we're dead, and we're gone, we're gone for good, we're, I mean, we're completely wiped off the universe. Remember the emptiness that you knew, that you didn't know before you were born? I have a feeling that's exactly what it's going to be like after dead, death. That same, it's not even right to call it darkness or emptiness, it's just nothing. That's what we're headed back to, I think. Not because I know that, it's just because that there's no other good reason to think otherwise, and that seems to be that we came from nothing. After, when that happens, when we're dead, that means there's no chance for a final reunion with the ones who we left behind or the, who went before us. We can't, we'll never see them again. Grandma will never see her again. Our children will never see them again. We won't even know we, we're missing them. There'll also be no final reconciliation. If we left any of those individuals on bad terms, guess what? We never get to fix that. The universe will carry on forever with the bad, poorly settled terms. Also, there's no chance for final justice. If we were wronged, there'll be no right. It will, it will not be made right in, in at least through in, the, in our lives, right? I mean, someone could make it right in afterwards, but what could that do us? We're gone, right? Um, unless you're just thinking about the overall justice, principle of justice itself, maybe. But you get the point, right? No reunion, no reconciliation, no final justice. If someone wronged us and you want to make things right, do so while you're alive and while they're alive, hopefully, and you can, you can, you can basically, uh, you know, balance, put the universe in a little more balance, so to speak. Not that the universe gives a damn. So no, so that's complete oblivion. When we're dead, no final reunion, no final reconciliation, no final justice. The next one is. Um, The Great Life Adventure. That's kind of talked about that already, right? In the risk of avoiding risk, I said, you know, in the last five, six years of your 20s, give yourself a great life adventure, whatever that may be. Maybe that's just, you know, getting yourself a little apartment somewhere and sequestering yourself away reading books for five years. I don't know, whatever it is, give yourself that adventure. You'll be glad you did. Quite a worthwhile endeavor. But then, also keep that up throughout life, maybe in smaller measures. I do this, for example, every two weeks I get Fridays off at work, every other Friday off at work. And I use that time, I go out to the desert. Today's that rain. I go out here, have an adventure. Usually I go out to the desert that way. Every once in a while I come out and spend a day with my mom. It's a continuation of the great life adventure. And I had lots of great life adventures in my 20s, in you know, my teens as well. It's a worthwhile thing. Give yourself that. You'd be glad you did. Mike feels a little strange again, tempering my anxiety that's rising and uh, applying reason to again remember that I, I, can, I can do reasonable responses if that happens. The heat's not so hot that I'm going to die of heat while I'm waiting for a tow truck. I've got cell range here. I can, I can call my mom and call the tow truck. I'm okay. Continuing to finish up, just uh, three more left. Next is uh, after Great Life Adventure is uh, the season of philosophy. If you're lucky and you've given yourself a life <coughs> where you've got something to think about and talk about, then why not uh, allow yourself some time to record that, put it down in words? Especially if you feel 
let's go this way. If you feel the, the call of the muse, the muse, of course, you all know what a muse is. I don't think there is any real muse out there. No spirit, no whispering voice in our, in our ears telling us uh, a word of inspiration. The muse is simply uh, that inspiration that rises in us by virtue of the fact that we've lived a, an interesting, you know, f purposeful life. Uh, purpose that we developed and we, we've lived some great life adventure we got something to say about it maybe we learned something when, those, when that time comes and you'll know it when it comes that record whatever it is that you're hearing whatever words you've got to uh, write down or record or, or make it to music or make a video or whatever medium you choose just do it at that moment for two reasons one um, That is reflective of the moment in life that you're in right now. Those same words will probably not be there 10 years later. Also, if you don't write them down when the muse is speaking, my experience has been, and what I've heard about others, is that the muse kind of passes away and you won't have the words anymore. The, the muse comes upon me like a spirit and it's, an, it's a motivating force of inspiration that I can, if I get the pen going, it's almost like I don't even have to think. Now, I don't think it is the spirit. I don't think there's any supernatural force, like I said, acting on me. It's just, it's just the kind of like the, the chemicals in my head or the stewed up just right. The pot is bubbling over and, and the energy is flowing out without even me having to make an effort, right? So that's why, and you can uh, distinguish the words that come from me from the muse in my books by listing them in italics and um, with left left justification and I actually put a heading on them notes from my muse there each chapter will typically of my of going alone for example has a section called notes from my muse where I write down the stuff that came to me in that manner versus the stuff that um, was forcefully pushed out of my head by willful effort that's good too but it's different I think we're going to come across the no or not the aqueduct Nope. Gonna come up on 136 right now. We're gonna join the big highway. Almost done. <coughs> One more. That is the. Let's go straight, maybe up to the aqueduct. We'll go finish at the aqueduct. First, let's make our way across this highway. See a church out there in the desert. Get us straight across this highway. There's a natural river straight ahead. Whoa, this is going to be a tough one. I can do it. I can do it. Here we go. Right up here. Natural river called the... Ca not a natural river. A man-made river called the California Aqueduct. And uh, quack, quack. And uh, it's where California diverts a lot of the water from the Feather ri River up in Northern California down to Southern California to, to feed uh, thirsty people and water uh, uh, dry yards. <laughs> Let's park the bike here for a second and we'll look over the edge and finish up this video. And it's so tempting now to <laughs> to, <laughs> to invoke <laughs> poetic metaphors like you can see the flowing water there and say that uh, <sighs> this next this next one this last one last of my principles is the principle of um, arena and utility all of these six objectives and these 20 principles they are instruments and tools that I use in the pursuit of a good life that's why the next book's called The Good Life and I didn't, that's not my idea I borrowed that from the Stoics the whole concept of good life, which flows and meanders here. I'm poetic license, <laughs> just like this water flowing by, it flows and meanders for a certain amount of time. Eventually, this this water emerged emerged into the canal at the Feather River, and will um, end its journey in the faucets of Southern California, sands, uh, um, algae. Bloom, bloom, uh, bloom it in there. So too, uh, our lives will flow from birth to death. There, I did it. I got that. I got that. That hokey analogy in there, imagery, metaphor. And along the way, 
there's opportunity to live well. One more. There it is. Choo-choo train honking away in those four, four, just like I hear in Siberia. Along the way, there's a, it's a, life is an arena for the application of our principles, which are like utilities. They hang like, like tools on a tool belt and allow us to uh, more honking. Let me just wrap that up, finish it up, come around. It's kind of hokey to try to get the water thing. Okay, two more. Honk, honk. Short, one more long. There you go. That should be it, unless there's another train. That sound is bringing me back to Siberia. So all along the way, this last, last principle, arena and utility, just reminds me that I have, life is this place where I can pursue these objectives and use my principles as tools along the way. That's what this is. And that's why I develop these. And that's why I live this life. It's my attempt to make good use of my time so that when the end comes, I can say, yeah, today was, today's a good, a good day to die. That old cliche. And with that, I'll sign off. Thanks for joining me on this Good Life Meditation, everybody. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Make it a good life. Bye-bye.